Hi guys, this is my Outlander and Dragonfly and Amber book review on Melissa Elise TV, so stay tuned. <laughs> What's up everyone? I'm Melissa Elise and you're watching Melissa Elise TV. Welcome to week four of book club. This is also week one for Dragonfly in Amber, but we will start by wrapping up those last four chapters of Outlander. Diana definitely packs these last chapters. When I finished at first, I thought not much happened, but as I went back, I realized there's a lot going on. Chapter 38 brings Jamie and Claire to the Abbey off the coast of France, where Jamie's uncle, Abbot Alexander, welcomes them in, but their troubles aren't over yet. Claire has to fight to save Jamie's life and soul, even to the point of fighting Jamie himself in chapter 39. It's a wonder that Jamie doesn't actually kill Claire during the opening opium induced rage which she conjures her best blackjack impression. Fortunately for them both, the tapestry covering the window comes down in their struggle and lets in fresh air to break the trance. Then chapter 40 sees the return of Jamie's will to live as he heals and Claire tells her truth to Anselm. I really enjoyed her relationship with Anselm. He's a great character for Claire to open up to and I love his curious spirit. Claire definitely needed someone to talk to, and Anselm offers her wisdom, guidance, and compassion for her situation. By the end of the book, Jamie and a pregnant Claire decide to head for Rome to join the service of the exiled king, James of Scotland. Overall, I enjoyed Outlander. It's an excellent introduction to Claire and Jamie and a compelling roller coaster of events. I did think that the ending would be more of a cliffhanger or a little more exciting. Diana definitely wrote it with book two in mind, which kind of makes me think that Outlander doesn't stand on its own, but I guess that's not a bad thing. I'm still glad I read it, and now on to Dragonfly in Amber. This book has a prologue, which in part is only significant because book one doesn't, but I can only think that it's meant in some way to signify that Claire is back in her own time. She talks about waking up at three different points with three different emotions, and the last time she sees the standing stones, which only she knows the real purpose of, kind of. But as chapter one starts, we're propelled 20 years into the future, and in the wake of Reverend Wakefield's death, sad pun intended, Claire and her daughter Brianna show up on Roger Wakefield's doorstep so that Claire can pay her respects and ask Roger to help her with a project to find out what happened to the members of Clan Fraser that fought at Culloden. This starts the plot off on this research adventure as Roger begins to find contradictory information while Claire builds up to telling them the truth. We also see this budding romance between Roger and Brie, but all this takes the back seat to part two, The Pretenders, at the start of chapter six, where Claire begins to tell her story, picking up from 1744, Lua Free France. Somewhere within Claire's description of events, we find out that they decided to go to Paris instead of Rome because Bonnie Prince Charlie is heading for France, and Jamie, via his uncle, Albert Alexander, has been recommended to the King of France as a translator. Perhaps the most shocking part to the start of Dragonfly and Amber isn't so much the time jump, but the point of view shift. Chapter one starts from Roger's POV and then halfway through shifts to Claire's. Then there's a steady back and forth between chapters from Roger's to Claire's until chapter six. Another shocking part for me was actually when Claire finds Jamie's grave in the kirkyard of St. Kilda in chapter five. I was not expecting that and I totally understand why Claire screamed and reacted so dramatically. It's pretty early in the book to have a favorite passage, at least for me, but I did like how Jamie talks about the responsibility he bears as Laird of Lollybrook. There's a part of him that wants to run away from the pending doom of Culloden and just raise a family with Claire, but if he did, he says, There's a part of my soul would feel forsworn, and I think, I think I would always hear the voices of the people that are mine calling out behind me. It's so beautifully put, and it really gets to the heart of why they're trying to stop the rising. And Jamie's lines are the best. Of course, new book brings new characters. We have Roger Wakefield, Brianna Randall Fraser, and Jarrett Fraser, Jamie's cousin. 
but my favorite so far is Roger. I like Roger. He's smart and interesting. We don't know that much about him other than the fact that he's the Reverend's adopted son, his nephew really. His parents died in World War II and the Reverend really did raise him. So we encounter Roger at a fragile time where he's lost his father. We do know he's a professor at Oxford in the history department, which makes him well suited for the job that Claire gives him. And he does have imagination as Claire finds out when she starts telling her story. What I like best about Roger is his feelings towards Brie and how he carries himself when he's around her, sharply contrasted to the way he acts around Fiona. But I can't help but like those parts too, because the way he acts with Fiona are among the most comical parts of this book so far. That's it for this week's book club, but I have a question for you guys. If you were Claire, would you tell Brianna the truth? And if you were Brianna, would you believe her? Let me know in the comment section. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next week. If you enjoyed this video, like and subscribe for more.